Awesome to welcome Mega Basket head coach Marco Barich to the Basketball Podcast. Marco Barich is a serving professional coach who's currently the head coach of Mega Basket of the ABA League. He started his coaching career in 2009 as an assistant coach in the junior selections of the Super Fund, and then in Cervana Zavidita, and then in 2013, he became the head coach of the Italian team Orton, after which he was an assistant coach in the Polish team Sharna Sloops. In 2016-2018, he was head coach of Torlek, and then for one season, coach of Malus Zuman, while for the previous three years, he was the assistant coach in Igotkia. On several occasions, he has been the assistant coach of the youth national teams of Serbia, which won bronze medals at the Under-18 European Championship, silver at the Under-19 World Cup, and bronze at the Under-20 Euro Basket. Marco, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris. Thank, thank you for having me. Well, exciting to have you here. And uh, we have some shared acquaintances that led to this. And uh, all that came from your experience of being embedded with the Denver Nuggets during Summer League. And uh, why don't you shed some light on that? What is that experience like? And uh, what type of value did that bring you as a coach? It was a very valuable experience. It was uh, my my first visit to the States and the first first contact with, uh, with the NBA team. Um, even more interesting was that I I got I got the invitation, let's say four or five months before before they they became NBA champions. So I I accepted that that invitation uh, in maybe let's say around the new around New Year. And when I when I went there, they were NBA champions. So it was it 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 gave an even even higher level, even different level to all that experience because they they all had. In 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 my eyes, I I thought that they are having now the the responsibility of doing everything better, everything more serious because they are they are the, the actual actual champions. So it was it was wonderful experience, uh, a lot of lot of uh, good good memories for me, a lot of uh, great great friendships. the ho- The whole organization is is fantastic, and the the coaching staff was was so good so it was it was nothing nothing but 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 a great experience well i know our mutual uh, friend charles clask uh was a was a big part of that experience for you and that's really what sheds light on these experiences is it's not just being on the court and the basketball it's all those conversations you get to have with different people like the dinner we referred to with you and charles and matt klein and some other people that we know it's all those other experiences that add value too isn't it exactly charles is a is a wonderful basketball mind you know and uh we had we had like a, a big gap between the between the breakfast and the game it was it was a couple of hours of free time you know and, and vegas is is not a boring city as you know so a lot of things to do in vegas but we end up with a with a, with with one big whiteboard you know and and and, and a couple of pens you know and we spent so many so many hours uh, talking about basketball drawing things so yeah so a fun. little bit of basketball junkies right so fun so fun well we're going to try and uh, share some of those things and other things uh, from your experiences in basketball and uh, maybe let's start with uh, something that i know that is very important to you and that's KYP know your personnel can you talk about that yeah i think that's that's very important for every coach uh, there are different different uh, aspects of of KYP. Maybe the first one is is technical, technical, and maybe tactical. And it's the maybe the easiest the easiest thing to recognize. You know, it's uh, who is who is the creator, who is who is the the the, the role player in a way that. I always, as a coach, I, I always like to to know who makes advantage and who uses advantage, and that is that is a really important thing. Sometimes when you tell to the guy that he is not the one who actually creates, maybe it's not easy for them to accept. But if you tell them that they are the one who use it, who use it, then it's it's a little bit easier. And I think that is a big truth. So first part of KYP is know who is capable of, capable of doing what offensively and defensively with a basketball in their hands or without. Um, second part of, of that is a is little bit more difficult because it you need time as a coach and it's good if you have if you have a team that plays 
played a couple of years together, and that is like mentally, mentally KYP. So you can't know with a new team at the beginning of the season how how somebody copes with the pressure, how somebody plays in in difficult situations, in in even game fourth quarter, maybe overtime. Yes, sure. When you select players, you 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 try to get as many information from from their past coaches as possible. Uh, of course, that you want to watch how they play in a, in the fourth quarters. Of course, that you want to watch how they play good games, how they play their bad games. But you have you need time, and you you have to feel them. You have you have to feel them mentally to know and to be sure that you that you know know your personnel mentally. So it's a mix. It's a mix of those two things, but it is for every coach, I think, the the most important thing, giving uh, giving the roles to the certain players and putting the players in the places on the court where they can where they can perform and and help the team the best way possible. Well, I love that. And then you're in that situation now, taking over Mega and uh, trying to figure out uh, your personnel. So maybe give us an insight before you even start with a new team like this what are some of the ways that you're trying to figure out your kyp i have luck uh, i i this is my second season in, in mega and it is completely new team but i know most of the guys because they 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 played last last season in our development team so i used to watch all those games and uh, they they were in a very good program with a good coach so now I have luck that uh, more or less I I know all of them, so it's 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 much easier for me to put them to put them in a spot where they can where they can perform, and I think it's easier for them to have that kind of of uh, trust in me as the coach because because they they saw they saw what I what I did with the guys previous season, so yeah. that is that is important thing you know. Great stuff. And, uh, you know, going with KYP are two other things that I know are important is, is who is a PR guy and who is a DHO guy and very important in the modern game, isn't it? Yeah, it's very important. Uh, get, uh, basketball is game of mistakes, obviously, you know, and everything happens because of somebody may, made some mistake. Uh, but for me as a coach, it's it's very important uh, not 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 that every mistake or every turnover is the same for me. Um, the guys who who create, who are the ones who make advantage, they have a lot of responsibilities with with ball with ball in their hands, and uh, a lot of turnovers will come from their from their job. Their job is to to do to do difficult difficult things. For me, when somebody who is not there to create but he is there to use advantage. If he makes more than one one turnover per game, it it drives me crazy, you know. So they all need to understand their roles, and uh, for me, obviously, the difference between pick and roll guy and DHO guy is uh, how capable of putting the ball on the floor and how capable of making decisions of the bounce that player that player is. If the guy can pass from the dribble, if the guy can pull. From the dribble, if the guy can make some moves from one hand to another from the dribble, then he is a good can- candidate to be a pick and roll guy. If the guy cannot make good decisions when the ball travels from his hand to the floor, and and vice versa, then probably I will I will have him take the hand off and have the ball in his hands when he needs to make a decision: is it a shot? Is it a pass? Or or some or some simple simple continuation. Yeah, fun stuff. And, and and also not easy part of all that is having the having the second guy, and that is usually a big guy, having him know who is he making cooperation with. So let's say there is some kind of high pick and roll, and you open your big on a short roll or a, or on a pop, and now there is a guy in the corner. And you want two man game on on empty side. Now, big guy needs to know who is the guy who is who is playing two man game with. Is he passing the ball, continuing going to the pick and roll, or he goes to the DHO? So everybody needs to know and understand each other's roles. Of course, they do, and uh, I think is connected to that is your phrasing of customer or client. 
Yeah, uh, I think I, I, I really believe that uh, great teams in great teams, everybody participate, you know, and as the team is growing from the beginning of the year, probably till the end, the great things, uh, the great teams start to to have that the, the players start to have that sense of ownership in the team, you know, and if they bought the program at the beginning of the season, and that is the job of, of that is our job as coaches to sell them the program. And if they see that during that process with your program, they improve individually and they improve as a team, most likely they will, they will have, they will start to have that sense of, of ownership, ownership, and they will, uh, they, they will, feel that they they, they want to be included in in some some decision making or anything in the team and for me the way the way sometimes i i do it at the beginning of the season because obviously they are not ready if it's a new team especially if it's a young team they are not ready to be part of of decision process that is that is on 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 us as the coaches but try to sell them Think that they are important and try to try to give them some decisions. You know, something that you are not really interested in, something that is not the most important important thing for you as a coach. Uh, ask them what what they want to do as a team. So I don't know what tomorrow. Maybe the practice can start at seven p.m. It can start at five p.m. For you, it doesn't make a big difference. You know, ask them. Ask them, okay, guys, what do you, what would you like? What do you want? You want to practice at five? You want to practice at seven? And they start to feel important, and they start to feel, you know, like they are a part part of something. They are taking the ownership. That's at the beginning of the season. It really doesn't matter. But later on, when you are playing the playoffs, and where the all the teams know each other so well, and they are so well prepared, you need your players to. To, to to give something extra, you you need them to to have that sense of ownership. It's great stuff, and uh, you know, getting into some more of the tactics a little bit. Well, maybe before we do, let's let's talk. I mean, there's a perception of Ser Serbian coaches, and certainly ones I've been around. You coach hard, right? But but what does that mean in terms of your vision of what coaching hard means? Because we know it's important, but what does that mean? I think it's. It's demand demanding. I think it's it's nicer word. It's demanding. I think Serbian co coaches demand demand a lot. Um, I think that every coach needs to be honest. Needs to be honest with the player. I think that's the most important thing. It's not always pleasant, you know. It's not always with a sugar sugar coat. But being honest, you know, it pays off eventually. It pays off eventually. It 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 makes it makes the the the, the whole process much much easier. So, of course, I think all Serbian coaches and I I think coaches overall, they should demand. They should demand. You know, they should demand a lot, because uh, the less you demand, I I think I think players players will will give give less you know and if you demand a lot and if you're honest with a player if they see that you really care about their improvement if you show that uh, care mentally and physically day by day i think that i think that is a that is a right way nowadays it's not easy to make that connection with uh, with players it's a different different time from the time when we were growing up Everything changed, you know. It's uh, we don't have a lot of things in common with those kids. They watch different movies, they listen to different music, they they are spending their free time different than than we used to. And I tried I tried listening to that music and I I, I couldn't. So I I gotta try another I gotta try to find another way to. To, to make connection for me the easiest you know way to make some kind of connection and to to show them that you care about their improvement is go out there go out there wear basketball basketball sneakers you know and and sweat up with them 
go there, be physical, work out with them, you know, uh, try to play dummy defense while they are they are doing on some new move, you know, try to play, I don't know, give them tasks, you know, reading closeouts with you as a coach, being there, being physical, uh, being in some kind of contact, you know, I think that's the easiest way to to create some kind of relationship with a player and that will that will allow you to push him hard and to be to be very demanding. If That's you are just being hard, you know it will it will break. So it's kind of combination between elastic elastic and and inelastic. You know what I mean? I think that's the only the only possible way. That's a great example of meeting them where they're at. And uh, that's a great way to be able to do it. You share that value of basketball and development and uh, you getting involved. And we see that at all levels of basketball. Rebounding for a player can be as simple as that. So such a great example. Um, Talk to us a little bit about some of the tactics then in terms of some of the different things. Um, Trying to confuse responsibilities. What's the importance of that? That's, That's a little bit tricky, you know. You have, for me... You have young team versus the winning team. In young team, you don't wanna you don't wanna confuse responsibilities. You wanna have as less gray areas as possible. You gotta know what is what what is whose responsibility defensively. Let's say ball screen coverage. Who is responsible for deep roll? Who is responsible for the first pass on the help side? Who is making the X or whatever coverage you are playing? You need to make sure that they know their job and they know their responsibilities. Uh, I think that having your team know all the responsibilities, eventually it helps to the opponents some way because opponents know your responsibilities too. So I think that winning teams need to mix it up a bit. Winning teams, I mean teams that are made of experienced players, players who won already, players who know how to play. Uh, I think with them, having a little bit of gray areas, eventually it can help you because you can push them to do more. You can, uh, you can like sometimes, you know, not just tactically, but also handling your team. Having too many rules prevents you from making decisions, you know, and that is always the the danger. You as a leader, as a coach, you need to make decisions. Not only follow the disciplinary rule uh, or or something that that players signed, you know, and everything. It's the same on the court. You need players to make to make decisions, to make more responsibility. Uh, maybe you need you need less structure because they are able to give more in, intensity wise, you know, and so on and so on. So. For me, there's a difference, as I said, for the young team, uh, players who are learning how to play basketball, you know, who who uh, still are not fundamentally sound. You need to have you need to have responsibilities clear. With, with a veteran team, can you give us an example of uh, you know how you might confuse responsibilities to create an advantage? Yeah, you you gotta you gotta be you gotta be able to let's say you are talking about about uh, directional defense, and it's always the conversation about pushing baseline versus pushing middle. All levels of basketball, high school, college, Europe, NBA, everybody forces somewhere, you know. And then you go to the to the veteran team. And you you talk to the player and you tell him, okay, so in this area over here, you force him this way. And he tells you, coach, but sliding this direction, I'm slow as F, you know, I'm slow as beep. So it happens all the time. It happens all the time. So let's say play the best way you can. Play the best way you can. And we need to figure out, we need to figure out how to help you if you get beaten this way or if you if you get beaten that way you know then uh, usually the less rotations the more solid your defense is but if the players are playing with multiple effort 
even with more rotations, if they have experience, if they take decisions, if they make those rotations with active hands in the passing lanes, you know, maybe you need a little bit of a little bit of scramble, a little bit of chaos over there. So uh, and the most important thing is that in Europe, in high high European level, you cannot play the same defense for 40 minutes. It is impossible. You gotta mix it up all game, all game long. After a couple of possessions, let's say one quarter or quarter and a half maximum, the offense adjusts. They are so good at reading defense and the offense is always one step ahead. So they will take everything the defense gives them. So having the responsibilities and the team which is drilled to play the same way, it's it's really easy to beat. It's really easy to beat. So sometimes going from uh, looking from the side, sometimes, you know, all our uh, us coaches, we have big, big egos, you know, and sometimes we like our team to look good, to look drilled, to look organized, to look, but we need to let it go sometimes in order to win the game. That is the that is the most important thing for for the coach. Yeah, uh, a great example, and um, you know, connecting some of the things that you've talked about already in terms of being adaptable and adjustable on defense. And then you talked about rules and not trying to have a lot of rules, especially for a veteran team. But one thing that you do value is to try and take away the extra pass. So can you talk about the importance of taking over, taking away the one more pass? Yeah, for sure. You have a couple of examples. Uh, first one that I can think of is the is handicap closeout situation. It happens all the time on the wing that... For some reason, if if you had some pick and roll coverage or you had some some uh, help on the drive, you have two against one situation, forty five and corner offensive players against the one against the one defender, and you have another one which is which is coming. So the players should be drilled to recognize when those handicap closeout situation happens, and they should always close out with a with a hand in a passing lane. So. They, we should never allow the straight pass, chest pass going from 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 one side to another, especially from forty five to the to the corner. Uh, that's one example. Second example, which players are struggling a lot, uh, is when you are stunting on the drives. When you are stunting on the drives, um, usually it happens when in in shake pick and roll situations or or wing drives to the middle when somebody is attacking the nail and when the defender from the opposite wing is trying to stunt, nine out of ten stunts are too low. They are trying to stop the drive, but they don't have in mind that it's an easy one pass out for the three-point shot. And that's the easiest easiest shot in basketball. The Second easiest, first easiest is coming the ball coming from the from inside out, and the second one is coming from the nail, from the nail out. So they should always have in mind to make extra step up and then go stunt. So they are stunting in the level of the pass. They are stunting with their with their inside hand attacking the ball, trying to slow down the ball, slow down the dribble, and having the outside hand, the palm in the direction of the pass. So sometimes nowadays, you know how big three point shooting is. Uh, sometimes it's even better to give up to give up backdoor instead of giving up the, the the open tree because for the backdoor you have the corner guy who can tag. If you practice, you have the corner guy who can rotate. You have maybe the guy who will yell that there is a backdoor, so I will start to backpedal. I will be there to protect. But for a for a stunt without without being in the passing lane, it's easy pass out and three, and that is what that is what we hate. So yeah, I think that is that is really important, really important having the not allowing the the one more pass, the extra pass. And the other emphasis for you is obviously to take away that first pass if you can to the roller, right? You don't want the first pass to go to the roller out of a pick and roll or different situations like that. So what are some different ways that you take that away? Look, you have uh, let let's say the hedge defense. Everybody plays the everybody plays hedge. 
Uh, I think for young team, it is the best coverage uh, because it looks complicated because there is a lot of running, a lot of movement. Everybody is involved. But I think the rotations are, are the simplest because uh, everybody knows what to do. And there is not, not a lot of gray areas. So I think for young team, the team like mine in this moment, I think that's the that's the easiest the easiest coverage. Uh, in drop, it looks more simple because you have two guys who are not overly aggressive. You know, you they they seem like having the the, the situation under control. But how many times against the drop you saw the guy over helping from the corner and he receives the three point and he looks at the coach and the other times he stays with his guy and there is a dunk and then. The big man is looking for the help guy, and both of them are looking to the coach, because you gotta be smart, you gotta be experienced, you gotta you gotta read the game for for playing for playing like that. So let's say we play hedge, and we don't want the big to receive the ball. So obviously we have the low man, which is somewhere between the dots and the restrict, restricted area. That is the area where he waits for the low for the for the roll man for the deep roll. So if there is a pass going to that area, we tell to our guys, go go there and take take the ball, take his hands, take his arm if needed. You know, he cannot receive the ball over there. What's the problem? The problem is short roll, right? When you are making the hard hedge, you have problems with a short roll. One of the ways to prevent the big receiving the ball there is with having your guard plugging the short roll. So the guy who is guarding the ball handler in the moment of the screen when our big hedges, he is responsible for staying connected with the offensive big and not letting him receive the ball around the free throw line. How can he do that? He can do that if the big is holding the screen. He can go under him for one second and control the quick the quick roll like that, and then eventually let him go after after a couple of steps. And the other thing, if the big is slipping the screen. Maybe me as a, as a guard who, who, who I'm guarding the ball handler, maybe I can stay connected with my back, back pedaling into him with my with my arms up. So I prevent the short roll and remember that we still have the low man who is there to, to take away the deep roll. That is one of the ways. It's not the easiest when the ball handler is so good pulling up after the, the, the backup dribble or after he attacks the big man's hips. So you got to adjust. You gotta adjust when you are playing against the players like that. But we were talking about the hedge defense without with with uh, when you don't want the big to receive the ball. That is one of the ways. And, and, and connecting all this a little bit is is your goal of having X five help on everything that you want them to be first help if you can in most situations. Yeah, not in all situations, but. I find two situations that you really need to drill that are that are difficult for players to understand. I, I call that inversion. Inversion. So let's say the ball is on the wing offensively and you have the opposite corner filled with a three man or, or two men or whoever. And that guy is closest to the baseline, right? He's our low man. So let's say there is a baseline drive. He should be there and help. But... If you have the big, the five, playing somewhere around the nail, free throw line or elbow, or he's somewhere around the, around the paint, then we should drill that we have our big stopping the drive. Not just because he is bigger and that he's probably better at, at, at rim protection, not just because of that, but also because if you help with the small and now your big stays up with the big, Eventually, he will be the one who needs to scramble and rotate and make the closeouts out. And I think the the that's the bigger handicap for our defense. You know, having the big making closeouts at the end. That's why that's why we would like we would like him to help on the first drive and be there for the box out and for the rebound. The second situation it happens also. It's the similar spacing uh, when there is a mismatch or when you have the, the guy who cannot defend the low post by himself and they post up, and now we have the big who is somewhere up, the other big, let's say the five, 
who is up, and we have the low man from the opposite corner. Usually, when there is a post up, if there is a non-shooting big, he will start going down to the to the dunker spot. When he starts going down, now it's a question: Are we trapping or helping with our initial low man, or we want to make inversion and have our five become the low man and be there? So that's more or less the same spacing but that's that that are two things that we that we drill and that that we emphasize and and a lot of these concepts that you're talking about uh whether it's pick and roll coverage or helping from the five if you can a lot of it becomes easier because you're triple switching too aren't you to be able to get out of some of these situations where maybe there's a a bad matchup somewhere on the floor so can you talk about the value of the triple switch I think that is the second best way. That is the second best way to to play the switching defense. Uh, I think still the best way is selecting the team which can switch, <laughs> or at least putting the putting the the guy that is big enough to defend their primary ball handler. Uh, second best way is fixing the mismatch. Why I say second best way? Because still, when you are playing the switching defense, your intention primarily is to stop the ball movement. You want to limit the closeouts. You want to limit the number advantage. You want to keep the man in front of the man all the time. So you don't want any, any rotations. If you are switching out or fixing the mismatch, in a small amount of time, there is a running running situation you have the guy who need to run out you need the guy who goes in who communicate so we still are creating some kind of advantage and some kind of number advantage to the offense i think it's still good enough because it's important not to give up the paint paint is easy points from the paint but i would like i would like more if if i if i can put the the guy who has enough size on initial ball handlers so after the switch we stay home so talk to me you mentioned switching i know something that uh that you your preference again these are all preferences they don't always happen this way but your preference is to be able to switch on the high side can you give us an example of that and then maybe give us an insight in terms of why you value that um in 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 all those information that that you have that are right, this is the one. This is the one that that there is some kind of mis mis misunderstanding. We'll skip it. It's all good. Because, um, because that's, no, that's, no, no. Let's let's okay. talk about it. Let's talk about it. Okay, please. Uh, because it it's it's the same what I was talking what was what I was talking about the previous. Mm -hmm. So, if you switch from the high side. It's really good because you don't give up the quick pass to the big. And you make the defense play with some long passes, with some lob passes, and so on and so on. But still, if there is any, any kind of separation that will happen, if the big is playing, if the offensive big is playing right, and if he is using his hands in the screen, if he makes the touch screen, if he pushes you a little bit, there will be a little bit of separation that you will need to have the third man from the help side involved to protect that pass. And we go back to the creating number advantage to the offense while playing switching defense. And that is what we what we don't want. So I prefer I prefer switching under switching under having our big help with being physical on the on the switch being physical on the on the switch and not allowing his player to slip. Uh, I I prefer going under and being physical and not let the big go quickly to the roll. Let him feel my body, let him feel my presence. And then eventually when he is going under the free throw line, I will let him go and I will fight for my deny or I will fight, keep fighting for my front position. And now if there is a threat of a lob pass. I think it's a smaller space, tighter space for that lob, and we need less help from from the help side and less rotation and less number advantage, number advantage and less ball movement for the offense. And that's all what we want. 
uh, okay. with switching defense. Yeah, thank but you. We, for yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That's great to be able to add value in that way. So, um, uh, you know, another thing, I, uh, the seven point game. Can you talk about the seven point game and what that means to you? That's one of the one of the competitive drills that I like. I like to keep my practice as competitive as possible. I'm not sure if a lot of coaches agree with me on what I think is competitive drill. Uh, we can talk about it later. One of them uh, uh, is seven-point game. So it's basically really simple. We play on two baskets to seven, but the points only count if you make and stop. So let's say I score a layup. It's two, but it's not in the bank. We need to make a stop, and if we make a stop in the next possession, then I lead to two to zero. Okay, then you play, and if I make two and I don't stop, you make three. Now you need to make a stop in order that those three points count. And it's really simple. And the game can last really long if you are not playing defense or if you can't score. And it can it can it can last. Uh, less if if we are doing makes and stops. I think that's important. Important to to uh, have your team understand and know. Let's say we we lead like five to three and we score two points, and now it is the the, the defense. Now it it is the defense. We gotta give more than what we have in that moment in order to make a stop. It happens in the game all the time. You know, you you, you got to recognize which possession is the possession. You know, in the, in the game, in the fourth quarter, and you got to really, really be there, locked in, and try to make try to make stop. And for the opponent team, you need to make smart call. You need to try to make smart offense, good offense, because if you don't score, you lose the game. And you can, I, I know you said this, that you can add the criteria of three. So now you can combine score, stop, score, stop, score, stop, and then make it even harder, right? Yeah. Usually I do I do it as a, as a separate game. So let's say once we finish this game, it can be seven, it can be nine, it can be whatever you need in that practice uh, in, in intensity-wise, you know, whatever you need as a coach. And if I feel that we didn't have enough enough of playing time if it didn't last long enough or if i want to give the chance of rematch to the other team i say now we don't count points we don't play for points we just play for three consecutive possessions so we jump ball or the loser get a ball and we go if you make stop and make you win or if you stop make and stop you win so it can last for 45 seconds. It can last for 15 minutes. You know, it depends. And I think it is, it is, it is really, really competitive and it adds the value to, to, to the fourth quarter situation, you know, where three possessions in a row are a start of a run. And in fourth, in fourth quarter, for me, the most important thing is, of course, don't allow them to make run and no three points. So why we play to seven sometimes? It is not the same, you know, if they score from three possessions, if they score six, they don't win. So if they score three times two pointers, they don't win. But if they score three, if they score three and then maybe one free throw out of two, they win. So in fourth quarter, you don't want to you don't want to concede three points. It's it's really important for me. Well, I love it. And and you referenced uh, your version of a competitive drill. So I do want you to talk about that. But the one thing that connects for me is that your players probably compete because they enjoy playing basketball. And these games are basketball games, right? Where they get to, you know, explore their possibilities and play within the context of how you're playing. Yeah, this is where this is where a lot of coaches don't agree with me is that for me, the only competitive drill is five on five. I will repeat, the only competitive drill is five on five. 
a lot of coaches say, okay, now we are doing competitive shooting. Now we are doing competitive passing. Now we are doing, hey, guys, we can go in the gym, sit and play Texas Hold'em competitive, or we can play soccer competitive. It's all competitive, but it, 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 it's, it's not competitive real for basketball. Uh, I love it. I couldn't agree more, coach. Couldn't agree more. That's awesome. For me, uh, I found like two two different levels of of putting your team in a shape. You need to have competitive drills in order to put your team in shape, and that is playing five on five as a competitive drill. But you need the drills to make that shape last longer. So let's say you start your preseason early August or early September, and you need to be good enough in a month. You got to play competitive drills. You got to play five on five as much as possible. It's the only way to be good enough soon enough. But also you need to put a little bit of drills that are not competitive, that are learning experiences, teaching points, and so on and so on, so that shape that you got early enough can last longer because it's more fundamentally sound. Does it make sense? Totally makes sense. And I'm totally on board. I mean, a lot of coaches do drills where they remove the goal of scoring from the drill. And immediately that's not a competitive drill. If they're not trying to score, stop from someone from scoring. And obviously the game connects and one, the five on one five. More thing, yep. One more thing, sometimes... Uh, we are going away from potential problem. We are running away. So we don't want to punish the losing team, you know, and we end the drill and they they don't have any punishment. Yeah. No problem. I mean, yeah. if, if it was like that, a- anyone could be boxer, you know, and <laughs> when you when you when you receive the punch, it hurts, you know. So you gotta you you gotta know when you lose. Well, and everything's from the game, right? Like, look, I know you said this, less drills. Guys don't go 100% in drills anyways. So everything from the game, they go more more hard at. Exactly. I found uh, it drives me it drives me crazy when you are playing the dummy drill with the players and then you see the players who are in offense and who should help the defense work and you never see them serious enough. You never see them engaged enough you know and it drives me crazy i become nervous because they are breaking their automatics you know they are doing bad pivots they are doing bad passing they are doing bad and slow drives you know and they are not helpful enough for the defense and then i say okay uh i need to have my assistant coaches in shape as soon as possible and let them let them play the offense. Let them play the offense. We will talk about all the passing, all the rotations. And I think even players are more motivated because that's their only chance to to hit the coach, you know. It's their only chance to be physical with the coach. So I think they enjoy more, you know, when they need when they need to 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 hand check or when they need to bump the coach than than the other players. So yeah, when we are drilling it. We are drilling it, but when we play competitive, when we want competitive drill, for me, it's five on five. And you mentioned this uh, in in the notes I got that you, you can change up the rules of a drill, and that's part of the value of what you can do as a coach, right? You can change up the rules of the drill so that you bring out what you want to bring out that helps them in the game. You can do whatever you want that doesn't break break the instincts of the players in a in a long long run you know so let's say uh you want your team to play fast you know and how many times it happens that you grab defensive rebound and you have three players asking for an outlet pass or how many times it happens that you concede basket they score and now everybody is looking at the coach. Everybody look, is looking at each other, whose fault it is, whose responsibility it is. I mean, it's 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 2023. We have we have technology. We will look, we will watch the video tomorrow, guys. 
we'll watch the video tomorrow and we'll talk about whose fault it is. Now grab that ball, go out of bounds, inbound it as, as soon as possible. So the, the drill I use a lot is you have three seconds to cross the half court. The last player he has three seconds to cross the half court after a stop. So after we grab the rebound or make a steal, we need to run every single time. But also, if they make, you have five seconds to cross the half court. But the time is not starting when the ball is in the ball. The time starts when the ball goes through the net. So they score, the time starts. Five seconds, you need to inbound, you need to run, you need to find good outlet pass, you need to run and try to score, or not to score, that's not the good expression. You need to try to make advantage as soon as possible. And now it happens as immediately, it happens immediately. You take one or two balls away from them. You you call, you, you whistle when they don't cross and you take take away the ball. It's like a turnover. And they then then they go mad and now they start inbounding the ball quickly. They start running, they start asking for the outlet pass high. You know, it happens five or six times and they score, they make advantage and they immediately start feeling more happy and then you ask the other team okay guys but what you, what are you doing they have five seconds to cross the half court and you are backpedaling and letting them go and you automatically start working on your full court press because they don't want to let let it happen again so next time they score they will press full court so why do you need full court press drills why do you need fast break drills when you can create them playing competitive. It can, it can translate to anything. Inside game, you can score before the ball touch the low post or the paint, because we need paint trees, right? We need to touch the paint to have as many paint touches as possible. We need inside out game. We need to put the ball down. Uh, you want to work on your off ball game. So just say we play our playbook, but instead of Pick and rolls, we do something else. We do screen screen away. We do handoff. We do anything you want. You don't do it every single day because it is it is not as game-like as as it is it should be. But every single day, every single game uh, day, different rule that goes to the thing that you want to practice that day. A great example of a constraint, like those three or five seconds that you emphasize that that shapes learning in ways that you don't have to spend all this time talking and lecturing and coaching. And I, the other thing I really want to highlight, Mark, that you said is break instincts. Isn't it amazing how so many things we do as a coach with our bias about how a player should do something breaks their instinct and in a way slows them down rather than speeds them up, which is our intent, right? That is a huge mistake. That is a, a huge mistake. Uh, you got to use their instincts. The best players have best instincts, you know. And you you got to help them limit the thinking, thinking during the game. You don't want them to think. If you think in this game, you're dead. If you think, you can't win. So you want to practice reaction. You want to practice to play based on what you see, uh, you want to practice and cherish making quick decisions, even if they're wrong at the beginning. Uh, bad decision is better than slow decision. Slow decisions destroy your offense and your game overall. So push them to make quick decisions from the very beginning and work on decision making day by day and eventually it will it will be it will be good combination totally agree on that well said and uh while i have you here i know uh you know talking about defending the dribble handoff i mean it's such a big part of the game nowadays especially at your level there's so many dribble handoffs so talk a little bit about your dribble handoff defense and some of your preferences in terms of those things it's similar to the to the ball screen if it is entry, if it is high, then we can go under. If it is part of the offense, if they are 
trying to make advantage out of that. If they are trying to be aggressive, then we want to break it. We break it by having our big attacking it, attacking the, the, the big who is trying to make the handoff, attacking with hand and basically putting their body between the big and the guard who is there to, to receive the handoff. By doing that, basically you are now for for a split second as a one body you and the big and the big with the ball and it gives a gap for your guard to go under at the point of the handoff and to meet their guy to meet their guy after after they get a handoff it puts you in a good position and good angles to defend the re-screen action because your big is already there and your guard guard has a little bit of separation but that's why the big is there and he's ready to make the hedge or whatever you are doing to stop to stop the ball handler and to buy time. So it's a little bit different than, than we used to do it in the past. In the past, we were there, we would yell open. Then we in a, in the last moment, we would make a gap. We would create a gap for our guard to go through. That's what we do still with our guard-to-guard -guard handoffs, which are usually not aggressive they are just there as a preparation for some other action but with a big to guard handoff we try to break it we try to attack the ball we try not to to give the the the, the open line between the ball and the guard's hands we need we want to slow them down and to to create a gap for our guard to go to go on Coach, I spent a time, uh, a bit of time last week with a NCAA college program, and it, it, it's it's such an amazing thing that the the closeout is still such a polarizing topic, somewhat. But when you talk to any professional coach, the closeout's pretty simple in terms of what the professional coaches teach. So, talk to us a little bit about no chop, one chop, or different things in terms of long and short closeouts. Yeah, so we we talked about. Uh, forcing middle or forcing baseline earlier most of the most of the teams as i know are forcing baseline uh, some teams that i know that are very very good are forcing middle because they think that it, it is a more crowded area um, for me it's more like based on kyp know your player know who are you who are you guarding? Who are you closing out to? Uh, a lot of players in Europe are able to put the ball down on the floor just in one direction, especially on closeouts. It has something to do with the past, with with the past, with the referees calling every everything like a travel when you when you want to go to the same foot, same hand, first step. So a lot of guys are able to make a shot fake let's say and put the ball only in one direction so you gotta know the scouting you gotta know your player kyp uh you gotta know the most important thing is who in the opponent team is the killer shooter the killer shooter that is his game is three point shooting his game is not two point uh, dunk layup floater or creating for others so we want to run him off the line. We want to run him off the line. I've seen different different uh, kind of of runoffs. I've seen a lot of guys just want 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 to fly by, to fly by, to go out of the position, and then eventually trying to like making the rear view contest on a on a two point. For me, that's the not, that that is not the best the best option because it creates the the open trees on the other side of the court. So you run him off. But if you go completely out of the defense, somebody else needs to rotate over there. And we are making, instead of having the contested tree, we now we give up maybe the open tree on the other side, which is what we don't want. So instead of making the flyby and then trying to come back, I would like them just to keep running until the point where you can touch touch the player. So no chop steps, no, I don't know, forcing left, forcing right. Keep running with hand up to the level when you can touch him. That will most likely, because he is learned when you see the guy sprinting, put the ball on the floor, 
that will probably run him off the line, but you will still be able to have some kind of control. At least you will not be out of defense for the next rotations and so on and so on. If there is a guy which is not our runoff, that is like regular three-point shooter, uh, then we make a like usual conservative closeout, chop your steps, know your player, which side he's going. If he is shot fake going left, which is which is really common thing in Europe, then you should try to cut him off. No left, no left for him, make him go right, and so on and so on. Love it. Great detail on that. And uh you know, Mar Margo, you've been obviously a tremendous career in coaching and everything with it. And I think there's a fascination around the world and certainly people I talk to with Serbian basketball a little bit as well. Um, and I know you've been involved at age group levels and different types of levels of basketball throughout Serbia. So can you maybe give us an insights? I mean, beyond obviously the passion and love of basketball, which is obviously there, what are some of the reasons Serbian basketball is so successful? This has been a good summer for us. You know, we have like NBA Finals, the MVP. We have we we are the second in the in the world right now. Our three on three guys won the world championship. Maybe I forgot something, but but just a note on that: if you haven't watched Serbian's three on three team coaches, go Google it, watch it. It's by far some of the best basketball you'll ever see. Yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing. The big biggest thing in in growing up in Serbia is that coaches are trying to to teach you how to play. You know, they are trying to teach you how to play. Of course, uh, we are, let's say, how how to say, we are trying to follow the trends. You know, and the trends are that now players are more capable of. Of, of making some tough moves, more capable of doing different things individually. And of course, that we should try to support the extra talent than, that some of the kids have. But still, I think we are, we are trying to teach them how to play, to be fundamentally strong. Uh, I would like us to teach more passing, like the way that, that we used to do in the past. Uh, I think that is one of the aspects of the game that is not drilled enough. For me, personally, my players, especially the ones that I was talking about, the creators, they don't ever spend the day without, without practicing their pick and roll passing. As well as the guys, as I said, that are using advantage, they never spend the day without practicing their closeout decisions. And it's not figure of speech. It's literally every single day. Uh, so passing is one of the one of the one of the one of the skills that I would like us to do to still to still work on more. But I think all of the coaches around Serbia that are working with very young kids with under 14, under 16, under 18 in small towns around Serbia out of the out of the big lights out of the big systems they still teach kids how to compete and how to play collectively five on five you know with all with all the with all the the values that we want as 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 best as basketball people sharing the ball being unselfish playing defense uh, working on your fundamentals it happens all around Serbia, and you have a lot of coaches that are never, never had had chance to go public, you know, and that, that are working tremendous job, tremendous job all around the country. Absolutely, and it and it does show. I mean, not just this summer, but almost every every year we see something special from Serbian basketball, and just so fun. It's so fun to connect with you, so fun to talk to you, and I, I cannot thank you enough, Marco, for sharing the game with us. We're all excited to watch you and your team play this year. Thank you, thank you, and I, I would like, I would like if 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 one of one one sentence of mine will will uh, make somebody think think differently or or maybe maybe have some other other views. It makes me happy. Uh, we all love basketball, and for me personally, I enjoy I enjoy this conversation a lot.